<clears throat> Good evening. Welcome to God's house for our worship tonight. As usual, the order of service is printed for you in the service folder. I don't have any uh, special remarks uh, about the service tonight, just our uh, general reminders about our offering being collected there at the door when you came in. We also have uh, uh, the service uh, being streamed on the television uh, downstairs. Let's begin our service then with uh, the opening stanzas of our first hymn, Before You, Lord, We Bow. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to all. Amen. How can I repay the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and I will call on the name of the Lord. Precious in the eyes of the Lord, is the death of his favored ones. To you I will sacrifice a thank offering 
and I will call on the name of the Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let your continual mercy, O Lord, cleanse and defend your church. And because it cannot continue in safety without your help, protect and govern it always by your goodness. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God speaks to our hearts in his word. Our first reading continues through the letter to the Romans as we near its end. And also then the sermon text for this week from Romans chapter 13. Everyone must submit to the governing authorities. For no authority exists except by God. And the authorities that do exist have been established by God. Therefore, the one who rebels against the authority is opposing God's institution. And those who oppose will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to evil. Would you like to have no fear of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will receive praise from him, because he is God's servant for your benefit. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because he does not carry the sword without reason. He is God's servant, a punisher, to bring wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. For this reason, you also pay taxes, because the authorities are God's ministers who are employed to do this very thing. Pay what you owe to all of them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, and honor to whom honor is owed. Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet. And if there are, is any other commandment, are summed up in this statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. So love is the fulfillment of the law. The word of the Lord Thanks be to God. Fear the Lord, you his saints, since those who fear him lack nothing. Many are the troubles of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Alleluia, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 18. Glory be to you, O Lord. Jesus says to us, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. But if he will not listen, take one or two others along with you, so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, then treat him as an unbeliever or a tax collector. Amen, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Amen, I tell you again, if two of you agree on earth agree to ask for anything, it will be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. In fact, where two or three have gathered together in my name, there I am among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. Our next hymn we sing, O Lord of Nations, hear our prayer.
we thank you for this land most fair, created by your might. For mountain, sunset, lake at dawn, for woodland bloom and robin song, for stars that lace the night. For farms and fields of golden grain, for science and for medicine, for wealth beyond compare, for leisure time and work to do, Lord, all these blessings come from you, signs of your loving care. Most grateful, gracious God are we, that in this country we are free to worship you above. We gather here to speak your name, then leave this place to spread your fame, that all may know your love. Forgive us, Lord, when we forget your gifts to share, your word to spread, to those who ache and bleed. Renew our will to help the weak, to feed the hungry, and to speak your word to souls in need. Dear Lord, may the words that I speak and all the thoughts of our hearts and our minds be pleasing in your sight. Our rock and our redeemer, amen. I suppose you could almost say that this is the pastor's worst nightmare. Maybe the pastor should have been a little smarter than to choose to do a sermon series on Romans without making sure we weren't going to get to Romans 13. Especially in election year, where there's a Supreme Court seat up for grabs now. I think you understand why. How lightly do I tread? Knowing that there are some who will think that I say too much, others who will think that I say not enough. A more difficult task when often people will hear the things that they want to hear and then the things they don't want to hear they don't hear at all, or they only hear the things they don't want to hear and then they get mad. And they become offended. Of course, there are those who say that talking about the government is none of the church's business, but God is, says a lot of things about government, so it has to be the church's business to proclaim God's word faithfully. So, of course, what I have proposed to do here today has its challenges, to be sure. I could easily spend eight hours or more straight Going through all the Bible has to say about those in government and our relationship to them. So it's a challenge to preach, and I think you're going to find out as we go along here, today is more teaching than preaching. It's difficult because everybody has their own opinion about things, strong opinions about things too. Opinions that cause blind spots and double standards and hypocrisy. So I think the one ground rule that we need to have before we approach the Lord's word on government is to make sure we do this tonight, that we separate the idea of politics from government. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know we live in America. And politics and government go hand in hand, right? But not in the Bible, they don't. 
so that God's word speaks clearly to us if we can do all we can to separate those things and then hear the word of the Lord to us, we can be absolutely confident that God is now going to bless us. As he tells us what earthly government is and what it is not and what our responsibility to the authority is. So, it's really clear here in this section of Romans what government is and where it comes from and why God has established it. Now what is it? Earthly authority is the extension of God himself into the lives of all people who ever live on earth. God has chosen to use certain people and to use certain institutions that he creates in order to do his work here on earth. And I've called it this several times in the past few weeks as I've referred to it as God's holy work. This is God, this is work that God has reserved for himself but now he chooses to use institution and people as instruments to carry out his work. And just to remind ourselves of a couple other instances, just for comparison's sake, where God does this. God is the creator and giver of all human life, right? But now God does his holy work of creating human life through husband and wife. They become instruments of God's holy work. In the institution of the church, God saves people, right? But God has chosen through the institution of the church and the establishment of the holy ministry of the gospel to do that work of saving people. God's holy work. And the establishment of earthly authority is also God's holy work. It's God's holy work of curbing the horrifying nature of sin in humanity. You heard the end of the lesson, all those you know, love, don't commit adultery, don't murder, all that kind of stuff. We know what sin does to that. We know that if sin is left unchecked, it will become absolute chaos. So after the flood, God instituted earthly authority to curb sin. There he did not include very many details when he said, whoever sheds the blood of man, by man will his blood be shed. Now here he fills in a whole lot more, doesn't he? He speaks very specifically, especially when he says, the government does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, like doing God's work, right? A punisher to bring wrath on the evildoer. The institution of government seems quite straightforward here, black and white in the pages of Scripture. Reward the good, punish the bad. And if that happens, then you come to the end of the chapter and everybody loves everybody. Now, that's not the way it is in 2020. We may scratch our head at God and say, well, why God didn't you just, you know, plunk down a code of law for all people to live by and not work through sinful human beings to do this? God did that. It's called the Old Testament. That didn't work all that well either, did it? Because of sinners. Now we may like to think our situation, the present, of real, the present reality of citizens related to their earthly authority is the worst that's ever been in the world's history or at least something unique, but let's think first of the Apostle Paul and the circumstances in which the Holy Spirit inspired these words to be written. He wrote them to the Christians who were living in Rome, the cesspool capital of the Western world at the time. And now what he writes here certainly would have made the Christians not very happy because they thought they had every right to disobey and to rebel against this Roman government. Paul was very familiar with a fellow named Caligula, who's best characterized as the insane tyrant. 
Next emperor of Rome was Claudius. He kicked the Jews out of Rome because he couldn't tell the difference between the Jews and the Christians. He put restrictions on all religions that would make any American familiar with the Constitution absolutely freak out. Next up, Nero. <laughs> Latin historian Suetonius and Tacitus just go into gory detail about what Nero did to Christians and even St. Peter and St. Paul. They were awful, wicked, vile. The system was so corrupt. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write, Submit. time of the Reformation was not much different. In his treatise, To What Extent Should Earthly Authority Be Obeyed, Luther wrote this, For God Almighty has made our rulers mad. They actually think they can do and order their subjects to do whatever they please. And subjects make the mistake of believing that they in turn are bound to obey their rulers in everything. So the rulers presumptuously, presumptuously set themselves in God's place, lording it over men's conscience and faith, and schooling the Holy Spirit according to their own crack brain ideas. So, it's nothing new. At times, government decisions seem absolutely ludicrous. Often, they're completely sinful. Strange projects bridges to nowhere, spending more than you're taking in, right? Laws authorize and legitimize behavior that the Bible clearly calls sin. So we have legalized sexual immorality in our country. People can gamble themselves into debt and poverty. And court decisions allow for the murder of the most innocent. One hundred percent of all people who serve in God's institution of earthly authority are sinners. In our system, whether they're executives or legislatures or judges or enforcement, all sinners. Through the course of history, some have been absolutely wretched and vile and government forms have been thoroughly corrupt but their character and their behavior and their form does not overthrow God's institution of government because sinners need it. Government is God's extension of himself into the lives of people to curb the horror of sin. Now as it does this work, government will operate only informed by natural law, the natural knowledge of God, and human reason, which all of those things are greatly impacted by sin, which explains why things are. Government is never going to operate informed by the Bible and we should never expect it to be because it is God that has separated this out. We often describe God's work as the two kingdoms, the kingdom of his right and the kingdom of his left. God's right hand kingdom, his right hand is the one that he uses to save us. His right hand worked the plan of salvation in Jesus alone. His right hand works through the institution of the church and the proclamation of the gospel and the administration of the sacraments to save people. But now God does not rule with one hand tied behind his back. He uses his left hand. He uses this other arm in completely a different way for a completely different purpose. And this separation is a very important one. 
the church does not do the work of the government, nor does the government do the work of the church. And if either somehow end up doing the work of the other one, that is not what God has established, and that is sinful. What the Bible says about some of these things are just not going to be popular, not even with us. And how many of you heard, pay taxes, and you're just going, right? God has a lot to say to those who are in authority. But unless we're in those positions, we need to spend more time tonight looking at what God has to say to us as Christian citizens. And here again, it's pretty simple. God says, submit. And in doing so, God is telling us nothing different than what he already says we are going to do in our relationship with all people around us, no matter who they are. What he says happens between wife and husband. Ephesians chapter 5, submit to each other out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands. It's the same also for children and parents. And the reason why this is is no different in all of these cases, whether it's submission to the government or submission between wife and husband or between anybody we might come in contact with. It happens because it's to the Lord. Phew! We don't submit to the government because we love it. We submit to the government because we love God. We submit to each other because we love God. Wives submit to husbands because of love for God. And in our relationship with the earthly authorities, God does not say submit only when they do their duty or submit when it serves your best purpose, interest, and opinion or submit only when they obey the laws that they've created for you to obey. He doesn't qualify in those ways. But our submission, just as it does in all these other places, is going to take on all kinds of different forms. That submission is going to show itself in obedience to laws and to those who enforce the law. It's going to show itself in showing respect and honor in speaking that way. In fact, I like to look at it this way. Would you call your husband or your wife the things you call the president? Would you say things about your husband and wife that you say about the government? Probably not. The submission comes in other forms too. God commands us to pray for those in authority. Do you want their job? I sure don't. That God lead them to do it well? This is our responsibility as a Christian citizen. Knowing that we are both, aren't we? We are at the same time Christian and we at the same time citizen. Now as citizen, our constitutional republic gives us privileges and powers as citizens that most people on earth do not get to enjoy. My goodness, use it as God's blessing. Do your civic duties. Engage in civil discourse because you can. God's blessed you with that. But as you do all of those things, as a citizen, you also do them as the Christian you are. And this goes far beyond obeying laws because unbelievers obey the laws too. This means what God says in his word and our faith will also inform and guide us as we live as a Christian citizen. And I know very well that puts us in a more difficult position because now we also have to be mindful with what God says about certain things, about 
many things that have intersection in that realm of being citizen. I also know that throughout this whole discussion, uh, people could be making an exhaustive li exhaustive list of you know pa pastor, but but what this and yeah, yeah, but pastor, this and of course I don't have time to specifically go through all those things. But it's pretty straightforward. It's pretty simple right here. As a citizen, as a Christian citizen. If the government does not compel us to sin and the government does not co-opt our conscience, God says, submit. If the government compels us to sin against God, then our only option is to disobey and in doing so, resist. Along the, with these examples of the apostles, not rebellion, but still disobedience. We will not sin. But we also must be willing to face whatever the consequences may be. And that also means that the fear of such consequences dare not ever cause us to blindly obey and so fall into sin. And if we face the consequences for obeying God rather than man, then we know we are in the Lord's hands. As straightforward as this is, we know that we live in this real life and it's never cut and dry, never black and white, because laws can be completely confusing. Loopholes will allow some to do something with a clean conscience while others' consciences are bound. Those who lead are sinners. Those who vote for them are sinners. Those who pay taxes are sinners. Those who spend the taxes are sinners. One pastor in our meeting week ago yesterday had characterized the Christian living in the civil realm as a citizen as a situation where we are just heaping sin upon sin on both sides of things. The leaders and their leading but also me. I have failed to submit when I have not obeyed even if I didn't get caught. I have failed if I have not prayed as God has commanded me to do just because it's not the person I voted for. I have failed to submit when I speak about them as we are perfectly free to do in America but not in truth and not in love but with hate and cynicism. Of course, I could keep going on, you know that. Especially when Paul brings up this matter of the conscience. When he does that, we know that we have to probably spend more time searching our own hearts and our motives, not letting ourselves so easily off the hook while we judge our neighbor because of the yard sign they have. To know that we have tough decisions. Choosing between sinners and sinners and platforms that go completely against God's will. We could look at this as Jesus described in the gospel last week. This is something unique that we have as Christians, therefore it is a cross we bear and often struggle with. But then, did you ever think about why Jesus was born in Bethlehem? Well, of course, because God said so in Micah chapter 5. A law had been passed. 
to be counted and to be taxed. Mary and Joseph had very legitimate excuses and yet they went. And then under the very same circumstances where we live as a Christian citizen under an earthly authority, our Savior was born. He's the same Savior who funded his taxes with coins that came out of the mouth of the fish, never complaining. He's our Savior who stood before the earthly power, body beaten, crowned and robed in shame, and reminded the power that be that all of his power still came from God. He told Pilate, you would have no power over me if it had not come to you from above. It was the government's cross that he was nailed to and they also paid the salary of the soldiers who did it and who stood there and made sure our Savior was dead. I have failed and remarkably so in my relationship with earthly authority. And yet for such sins, I see so clearly my Savior who has lived perfectly in this place for me from the beginning of his life to the end of it dying in innocence to forgive our sins and who now lives with all authority in heaven and on earth having been given to him as our Savior. He is our King and because of this each and every one of us We get to live in both kingdoms as God serves us with both hands, not with one or either of his hands tied behind his back. By his right hand, he has saved us, bringing us into his kingdom of salvation, saving us in Jesus and the gospel and the word and sacrament. With that hand, he carries us to our eternal life as citizens of heaven. And with his left hand, he protects us and provides for us and blesses us. So we know that it is our happy joy as Christian citizens to stand in both of God's two kingdoms. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen. Let's join together to confess our Christian faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
In peace, let us pray to the Lord and offer to him the petitions and supplications of a people, people confident of his promise to hear and answer us with his mercy. That we may seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him in the day of salvation, and be prepared by his mercy for the day of judgment, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy that we may delight in the light of Christ and his salvation, and that sinners may find refuge in his mercy and comfort in his forgiveness, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. That we may hear the voice of God speaking in his word and be nurtured by faithful pastors who preach and teach this gospel, let us pray to the Lord, Lord, have mercy. That this word may be the foundation of the home that husband and wife may be united in this faith and hope, and that their children may hear and be nurtured in this word by faithful parents. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the church may nurture the lives of our children in Sunday school and catechism classes, and that we may all be grounded in the doctrine of Scripture through the study of God's word. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy that the Lord may bless missionaries far and near, that he may nurture newly planted congregations and that he may renew those congregations in distress, that those from every nation and culture may be united with us in faith and life. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may enjoy the blessing of good government, faithful leaders, peace in our land and peace among the nations, and that we may be good citizens and neighbors, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That the sick may be healed, the troubled know peace, the grieving be comforted, and the dying be delivered to everlasting life in Christ. And that we may all be delivered from fear, anxiety, and despair by God's gracious care. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may honor the Lord with praise and thanksgiving and bring to the Lord the offerings of a grateful people. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may not forget the witness of the faithful who lived and died in Christ, and that we may be at last joined with them in the marriage supper of the Lamb in his kingdom without end. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Hear the prayers of your people, O Lord, and grant to us all things good and wholesome, and keep from us all things harmful. Give us contentment that trusting in your mercy we may delight in your saving will where the last are made first by your generosity and grace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We sing the last stanza of the hymn before the Lord we bow. to sing to heaven's high king salvation 